Um, that said, I'll see if I can get Peter to come on the video now. Peter, yeah. are you there, please? I'm here. Thank indeed. you. Would you like to welcome Lord Wallace? I, I will indeed. Well, thank you, Martin, for gathering us all and a particular welcome to the moderator of the General Assembly, uh, Lord Wallace, who's also a, a good neighbour. Uh, the St Cuthbert's Mance is just across the road from the moderator's uh, flat, and he's been a keen supporter, uh, particularly of the COP26 exhibition, which he formerly uh, visited and closed um, earlier in the year. When I was part of the selection panel for um, the, the moderator, I picked up the word that uh, Jim mentioned how really chaplaincy was something he was so keen about. And we were delighted that he accepted the, the invitation to come and speak to us uh, on the topic of chaplaincy today. I'm sure many, particularly in the urban setting, are discovering that parish ministry is very much a weekly chaplaincy ministry now as it evolves uh, to engage with the whole community. And out in the rural context too, we hear of uh, chaplains to the farmers and to the local communities. But also uh, nationally, it's interesting that chaplaincy is one of the things that institutions are still supporting. If you think of the armed forces, if you think of the NHS, they all see this vital role for chaplaincy. Anyway, someone who's got a great take on it because I know he's been exploring it during his year in office is Lord Wallace. So it's my great privilege and pleasure now to invite you, moderator, to speak to us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And uh, thanks to everyone who, who, who's joining us today. Uh, <clears throat> I, just, I just hope yesterday, for the first time in a very, very long time, I was doing, uh, I, I was responding um, to a presentation for the Scotland-Malawi partnership in about five minutes, 10 minutes before I was due to respond. Uh, whilst the presentation was happening, my internet crashed. Um, and there was some fairly frantic work done and I actually just managed to get back on, logged on in time. So. Let's pray that today this will this will go through without any without any hitch. Uh, but I've been really grateful um, to have been invited to uh, join you with the St Cuthbert's uh, Oasis Group um, and to speak on the topic of chaplaincy, as Peter has indicated, talk both generally and also to reflect perhaps on the very special form of chaplaincy, which I know this church and this group has facilitated. Uh, as Peter has just indicated. The origins of today's discussion can be traced back to my interview with the committee to nominate the moderator, of which Peter was a member. And as he said, I, I mentioned uh, chaplaincy is something I would want to promote uh, if nominated. And let's put it this way, shortly after my nomination was announced, uh, Peter was very quickly on the phone to discuss the theme of chaplaincy with me uh, and to highlight to me the resource which you have here and the outreach from St Cuthbert's, uh, an oasis in, the, in a busy city centre. And even if I suspect we're all meeting online today, and even if in recent months, uh, it's not been quite so physically busy with more people working from home. And of course, even that uh, throws up its own particular issues. And although this entry went into my diary in, I think as Martin said, in sort of October, September, uh, it was always very much the intention that I would, following on my original con uh, conversation with Peter, but also just over a year ago, I went and checked back through my diary notes, it was just over a year ago that I did have a, a meeting uh, and a discussion with Peter and with Ian Percy, who had I'd known many, many years previously through the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, and with uh, Martin uh, and with Maggie Romanis, basically to find out more of what Peter had initially described to me. And it was certainly agreed that during my year as moderator, I would come and talk to this group. Uh, so, so here we are. But if I just can spool back again for a moment, why was it that I wanted to reflect on chaplaincy and celebrate the work of chaplains? I think, I don't know if your experience is much like mine, but the, the last two years, or at least since lockdown started in March, 2020, I've kind of lose track of what happened when in dates and what kind of relative position we were uh, in terms of lockdown or more relaxed times. But certainly in September 2020, uh, when I met the committee to nominate the moderator, uh, COVID was very, very much to the fore. And it certainly seemed to me 
that those engaged in chaplaincy work were working in places where the pandemic had had a significant impact. The kind of places I was thinking about <clears throat> hospitals, the NHS, universities, schools, <coughs> prisons, about homeless people, and very much um, people who are on the front line, both in terms of addressing the needs of staff, uh, people who were and staff who were seeking to cope, as well as addressing the needs of those who were suffering from the vi virus, and in some cases, possibly putting their own personal risk on the line. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, there was also some COVID-related chaplaincy work that I hadn't thought of. <clears throat> Pauline Robertson, uh, one of the Church of Scotland's deacons and a chaplain to the Fourth Ports Authority, found herself being asked to give pastoral help to seafarers. Now, you may recall that there was that period of time when vessels were coming alongside, or at least were anchored in the fourth, but, but, but those on board, the crew weren't allowed to come off because of all the uncertainties and all the anxieties about COVID. And Pauline found, <coughs> as a deacon, she was having to deliver pastoral care for some weeks to those who were not being allowed to disembark. If I can reflect on some of my experiences to date, I have had the opportunity to gain greater insight into the work of chaplains. Inevitably, <clears throat> much of the work done is done quietly, unobtrusively, getting alongside people in people who find themselves in different difficult times or in unfamiliar places, in circumstances where there may well be stress or anxiety. And when my presbytery visits were being planned, I specifically mentioned chaplaincy. And indeed, my visit to the Presbytery of Edinburgh in October, last October, provided a number of opportunities to see the work of chaplains in different settings. And see this at close hand. And in addition to that, the Presbytery also arranged a reception uh, in the Great Hall of Edinburgh Castle, where I was able to meet a number of chaplains and to thank a wide range of chaplains and affirm that their work is indeed valued. And maybe just can share with you some of these places, some of these experiences. With regard to the universities, the University of Edinburgh chaplains, I met a uh, chaplain, I met in, in a new college, but I specifically met the chaplaincy team when I went to Edinburgh Napier University during that presbytery visit. A team that's just really establishing itself as part of the well-being and inclusion team at the university. I think a feature of that, which I've seen in other places too, in other forms of chaplaincy, is the very interdenominational and indeed multi-faith uh, approach that is taken to chaplaincy. They see their <coughs> core vision as offering a service to individuals, to be a listening ear, to help to provide a sense of community in a particularly a community of faith. They talk about the, their concern, particularly the health, not just of students, the health and well-being of staff as well. They were particularly mindful of the members of staff, the number of staff, overwhelming majority of whom were working from home. As, and as I say, that has its own particular challenges and pressures. The importance of addressing mental health issues amongst both staff and students. The importance too of providing somewhere where it was safe to go. Chaplains ought to and focus on the fact that they should be accessible. And that their experience was that many found that for those who wanted to seek their services, that ability, as it were, to go off campus, to have a, a space where they were not necessarily part of the formal uh, service was something which the, the, the students and indeed members of staff valued. It was also wanting people to provide uh, a multi-faith space. And the other thing the chaplaincy was trying to do and is trying to do at uh, Napier uh, is establish a presence in the university so that people know they're there. And not just for pastoral needs. Uh, they organized a COP26, an event, which I think they hope to be one of a recurring series of events to relate world events to the sphere of faith. And I was happy to take part in that inaugural event uh, back in, uh, in December, uh, where a number of people who worked in the university of lecturers and indeed representatives of the Student Association and people from the Interfaith Association 
spoke on their experiences and how our, our expectations and how they were met or not met of COP26. With regard to prisons, I visited Her Majesty's prison in Edinburgh at Sochten, and I've subsequently also visited Her Majesty's prison in Dumfries and been to the visitor centre in the prison in Perth. And there I've met chaplains and I've met the Sheena Orr, who as it were, coordinates uh, chaplaincy uh, for the prison service. The, again, I say there's an emphasis there on multi-faith teams. There have been a number of issues there during lockdown, both staff and prisoners, particularly those who are affected or members of staff who, who are affected and others have got to be laid off because of that. I think in one occasion, in two, having to deal with, with deaths of long-standing members of staff. In Dumfries, not related to COVID, but I found one of the, the, the chaplain there uh, has a, a quite an interesting job of teaching uh, biblical languages to those members, um, those, those people serving sentences there uh, who, um, who, 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 want, who want to do that. And the Prison Visitor Centre in Perth, which is run by the Church of Scotland's social arm, social care arm, Crossreach, Again, it's a place where families, families of prisoners found somewhere they could go. It was safe space. It was somewhere where they could unload and burden themselves, where they found there was a listening ear and no one was being judgmental. And indeed, the chaplaincy service for the prisons um, takes the lead in arranging Prisoners Week, which is a week when congregations are asked to remember uh, those who are in prison the families of those who are in prison uh, and those who work uh, in our prisons. Uh, and I think that's a very important part of the, the service that is, that, that is provided to people who, because they're locked away, literally, it's all too easy to forget. During my visit to the Edinburgh Presbytery, I met the airport chaplain at Edinburgh Airport, who also does work in the Kostorfin area and at the Gyle. It's a freedom to walk around the airport airside as well as uh, passing as well as uh, the, 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 the other side and it's been seen by staff and some of the people staff can go to and I think more not so often passengers but certainly staff know that there's someone there whom they can approach. A hospital, the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People, I gained some valuable insights into the work of the hospital chaplaincy with the, the Reverend Duncan McLaren who's the head of spiritual care for NHS Lothian and I think it was said in the introduction uh, that what is such as the NHS so value chaplaincy that they do recognize it and give it a, a, give it a status and give it a place within their organization. And particularly, I learned there and with those who are dealing with the families of sick children to provide a space for them. And most movingly, a bereavement suite uh, where it was just so moving and impressive, the caring sensitivity uh, that provision has been made for families, for parents and siblings of children who have died uh, to provide a space in which they can grieve and again unload. Interestingly, in terms of schools, I visited, a, I will not necessarily name it, but I visited an Edinburgh school where the question that came to me was um, what to do about chaplaincy. They don't actually have a school chaplain. There were some of the most senior pupils who thought there ought to be a place a faith space uh, and they were juggling with the idea of what they actually do with chaplaincy and I know they're now engaging I think with uh, Scott Shackleton who's the Church of Scotland's uh, heads up the Scot Church of Scotland's faith action team just to work through and discuss what kind of chaplaincy might be appropriate uh, in, in, second, in a secondary school. The armed forces chaplaincy uh, uniquely uh, the armed forces chaplains are recognized at the General Assembly uh, which might actually beg the question as to why we don't actually formally recognize others as well. But the chaplains who work, who serve in the armed forces are indeed embedded with the people they are serving. Their pastoral work takes them possibly to a different dimension. They have to have physical courage in times when they face physical threats. They have to have moral courage at a time when they face decisions which no civilian ever has to make. And emotional courage because they find themselves in situations where they're isolated or distanced from their loved ones. And those chaplains in the armed forces with pastoral charge face the same challenges and, you know, and 
uh, the, uh, the same separation and the same risks as those whom they are serving. And it's important that they are seen to be alongside them. And certainly the several encounters I've had with armed forces chaplains, I can only salute the commitment and the dedication which I've seen. So I say it's been a rich experience and I look forward to again engaging with you today because it's invidious to me for me to jump to conclusions, but from my discussions about a year ago, I think I've identified some, some common themes. Uh, obviously the very word oasis seems to me to conjure up a place which is very different from all its surroundings in the literal sense, in the original sense, a place which is a waterhole or greenery in a desert, a place where you might go to be refreshed. And physically or online at least, here you have a sanctuary. Indeed, in this case of St. Cuthbert, it's a place where for centuries people in this city have come for rest or for spiritual, uh, for spiritual nourishment. It's important because it's physically different from its city surroundings, from the places of work of many people here in offices or in retail. And hopefully it provides a different mental mindset, an opportunity to gather, to discuss, well away from the pressures of work life, of targets, of key performance indicators, of financial projections and balance sheets. And like an oasis, it's a place where you can be refreshed. I don't think it's anything like a session of Alcoholics Anonymous where you all sit around and discuss your latest problems, but inevitably relationships are built up, and built up with the chaplaincy team uh, in St. Cuthbert. And I was thinking too of the chaplains, particularly ones I met at university, where the emphasis was put on the provision of a place and a space which wasn't part of the campus, where students could go without, uh, without attracting attention. And as I've already mentioned, it wasn't part of some official scheme. And by a similar token, I imagine that for people working in the corporate sector, or indeed in universities or colleges for that matter, to find somewhere where you can go, you can share with someone who's not the HR department, and that must have its own intrinsic value even if the outcome of it is it actually puts you in a better place to actually approach the HR department. And I think there is a huge responsibility on chaplains, particularly to be available and to be accessible. And it follows on from that, that there is to be a willingness to listen. It's the case that it's very much part of our reformed Protestant tradition is the preaching of the word, but listening requires skills too. And I'm reminded of, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians uh, in chapter 12, when he talks about the many, many different skills uh, or, and callings of people within the church. Invariably, it will involve pastoral work. And I think it does beg the question as to whether there perhaps is a need for more accreditation of those who are engaged in this, that they do have acquired the skills of learning, of interpreting and of supporting. And one of the chaplains whom I met during my Edinburgh Presbytery visit talking about the pastoral world, put it like this, it's about trying to humanize the person in the situation in which they find themselves. To see the whole person, almost like trying to reconnect them with themselves. And it's a remarkable calling and it's a skill. Before concluding, I just want a final reflection because it came about as a very pointed and a very difficult to answer question that was put to me during one of my discussions on chaplaincy. And it was, what kind of chaplaincy service did you experience when you're a member of parliament or an MSP or indeed deputy first minister? And again, it was a question which one of my chaplains as moderator talked about when I was discussing coming to this meeting. And she said, reflect on your own experience. What support was there for the inner man, if any? And what do you think that should have been, what kind of support should have been provided when you were of, by the establishment, you were part of it? What do you think is needed to sustain movers and shakers in Scotland society? Now that initial question of chaplains, the question of support um, for, the, for the inner person, I think was very pointed indeed. And it had me stumped because actually there was a trite answer in the House of Commons, there's a speaker's chaplain who I think is available to be consulted by MPs. I'm still never quite sure whether the Minister of the Canon Gate is officially chaplain to the Scottish Parliament, and I can perhaps say in the House of Lords, there's always a bishop within 200 yards and in a good day an archbishop. But truthfully, I can't remember any identifiable support that was being offered. These were people who were there, but 
it was never really sort of stressed, well, they're there for your, for your support. If I can qualify that by saying and by acknowledging with thanks the value I have placed throughout my political life on knowing that the church regularly upholds our political leaders in prayer. It mattered to me when I was an MP and an MSP and as a minister uh, of the Crown. And I've also sought to reassure the Scottish party leaders when I met them in June, and indeed the Prime Minister when I saw him in November, that the church continues to pray for our political leaders. And then I know I had the, the prayerful support from those with whom I worship regularly. And although I was in the fortunate position of being of counting my parish ministers as friends, there's inevitably some degree of reticence and reluctance, even in a pastoral situation, because it's difficult sometimes to share confidential information about one constituent with someone, who, albeit in a pastoral position, who at the end of the day is another constituent. And there are many pressures and many confidences which you just find it very difficult to share. Well, I sometimes wonder whether it's that that holds you back or holds me back or whether it's the fact that I'm a male or more specifically a Scottish male, because I think traditionally we've been noted for being buttoned up. And it's perhaps a sad reflection that to feel the need to unburden is a sign of weakness. So I've tried to remind myself, stimulated by these questions, uh, that there is a good biblical precedent for withdrawing and for re-engaging. Throughout the Psalms you find it. Psalm 42, as a deer longs for a stream of cold water, so I long for you, O God. Why am I so sad? Why am I so troubled? I will put my hope in God, and once again I will praise him, my Savior and my God. You can reflect too that there's many times when Jesus withdrew from the crowds for periods of solace to pray and to communicate with God before re-engaging with the world. So maybe we've got the need for a two-way process here. A greater readiness on the part of those who are in positions of great responsibility to acknowledge a need to withdraw and re-engage, or at least to find time for a fresh refreshment, maybe a retreat, more time for prayer, and also the provision of more oases within our church with suitably equipped pastors and counsellors. And when I was praying about this and thinking about this, there was one hymn that kept coming into my mind. It's not entirely, that's wholly appropriate, but I think it's about a touching place. It's him by John Bell and Graham Mall, and just I'll read the first verse and the chorus. Christ is the world in which we move. Christ are the folk we are summoned to love. Christ is the voice which calls us to care, and Christ is the one who meets us here. To the lost, Christ shows his face. To the unloved, he gives his embrace. To those who cry in pain or disgrace, Christ makes with his friends a touching place. And perhaps a touching place may be the best way of describing chaplaincy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Wallace. Um, you covered a whole range of points on chaplaincy and you're a natural champion for chaplains. So thank you for that resume of some of the services and some of your personal experiences. Can I just for a moment go and close? I hate closing blinds when the sun's shining, but I'm conscious that it's, it's we, we thought it was your halo, sir. Yeah, <laughs> please do. And uh, this gives everyone an opportunity to ask questions of Lord Wallace as he deals with the blinds. And Howard, uh, I see your raised hand. So just wait a moment, and he will be back with us. Hope uh, that's better. <laughs> yes, um, your halo is gone, sir. And we can see all your face. I hope that wasn't too painful. Again, thank you firstly for that excellent resume of chaplaincy work and some of your personal experiences, including the fact that, if I heard you correctly, you didn't personally get a lot of chaplaincy help during much of your career. But let's hope that we, out of meetings like this and other work that you've done, that we promote the chaplaincy importance. Um, I see one hand raised already, and that's our good friend Howard who I should warn you, sir, is a very able golfer, so he, he's very good at his questions. Howard, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Lord Wallace. Um, please forgive my ignorance, as, as I didn't realise that Lord Wallace was going to turn out to be the same Jim Wallace uh, from the political sphere that I remember. Um, so that's, that's down to my ignorance. But 
I'm sure you have a full itinerary regarding all sorts of subjects and, and movements, but I would be interested to, to learn why and what drove you towards this current topic. And can you tell us if the House of Lords and indeed the House of Commons has a dedicated chaplain where issues can be shared and uh, discussed? Well, I think, uh, I think I explained that one of the reasons when I actually was um, being interviewed by the committee to nominate the moderator on which Peter Sutton sat. And, you know, the moderators asked, you know, during your year, what are the things, you know, if you were nominated, what would you be interested in doing? And one of the things I mentioned was chaplains. I think it's explained because I was very conscious at that time that chaplains were on the front line in terms of COVID. And I don't think they get, and I didn't think they get the recognition within the wider church, also not just the Church of Scotland, but the wider church, that they merited. I mean, I mean, a hospital chaplain, say, during COVID must have been very demanding. It was indeed, very demanding indeed. Prison chaplains, universities. I mean, we know these were all the places where, you know, there, there was perhaps more incidents of COVID than others. And it was, it struck me then, well, yeah, these are people who have been, you know, working on the front line. And if I just, as moderator, can I have an opportunity to say thank you to them even, uh, and to recognise, that was what prompted me back in September 2020 to, to say that. And and when I met the Presbytery clerks, I visit four presbyteries, I've still to do three, I've done one in Edinburgh, saying, you know, if I can meet chaplains, that's fine. And that's what I, you know, what I wanted to do. And your second question is one which I, I tried to address there because it was one I was asked in another discussion about you know, what kind of chaplaincy is it and frankly there isn't much I mean the, the, there are Christian fellowships but that's not the same thing I don't think as chaplaincy there's a speaker's chaplain which is and certainly that's more than um, a, an honorary post I mean it does involve work and it's not just chaplain to the speaker and I suppose if I'd had a real crisis I might have sought him or her out um but there's no, I was never, it may have changed. I haven't been in the House of Commons now for 20 years. Um, but there was no place that you could, in the same way as in a hospital, there's a hospital chaplain or a university, there's a university chaplain. There was no place I felt that you, you could go to. And that's what I was trying to reflect on at the end, saying, is that something which we're lacking and we really maybe need to start addressing? Um, and it's not just for people in, in, in politics, because there are others and other high pressure um, places. In circumstances where the nature of your work means that you're on the receiving end of quite a lot of confidences, uh, which makes it a, a bit more difficult to be able to, to share and unburden, because you've obviously got to respect confidences. And for that matter, chaplain says for ministers <laughs> and the clergy. Um, I remember once um, the death of a one of the, one of the one of my fellow elders in St. Magnus and meeting the minister who had done loads of work within the church, sent to the minister who I actually just happened to be with that evening and the day of the funeral, and I said, Quis custodia et custodies, <laughs> you know, who ministers to the minister? Um, and maybe there's an issue there too. Peter might be able to tell us whether he feels that the church does enough to support, um, to, to give chaplaincy support to ministers, but I certainly don't think it happens uh, as much in terms of those of us who are in a political position, and maybe that's something we should address. Thank you, Lord Body, for that answer and for your honesty <laughs> in uh, summarising that situation. I have two raised hands, so we'll go to David Strang and then to Andrew Gregg. So, David, first, please. Um, thank you very much. I'm speaking to you from a costa in Inverness, so I hope you can hear me okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I Thank you very much indeed for your talk, moderator. Um, and I was grateful to you for mentioning prisons and prison chaplains here. And I think I, what I was to say is, is more by way of comment than, than a question. But um, as you said, uh, people in prison are often out of sight and therefore out of mind. And I, I have inspected prisons for five years. I'm very aware of the, of the value of the work of chaplains you, you mentioned in, or you quoted in the John Bell hymn at the end about pain. And, Prisons are definitely places, places of pain. And I think the value that chaplains bring is, um, I would articulate as trusted people, because prisons are often not places of trust. And the value that a chaplain brings is 
that there's someone who, someone serving a sentence can trust because they're not in the line management, they, they're not making decisions about their custody and control, they're outside the authority line. And um, I, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning them and for mentioning Prisoners Week and just to, to say that the value is, is enormous and I think it's that element of, of trust uh, that really uh, brings a strength to what they do. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment, David. We'll, we'll go to Andy Gregg. Andy is the Director of Workplace Chaplaincy Scotland. Andy. Um, thank you, Lord Wallace. That was, uh, was very interesting. I'm glad that you've been around visiting lots of different chaplaincies across the country. Uh, I just wanted to share a couple of things about um, the start of the pandemic uh, for workplace chaplaincy. As you mentioned, a lot of those organizations that, that, that were facing frontline issues, um, there, were, there were actually a lot more because um, uh, we provide uh, a chaplaincy service to the Fire and Rescue Service who have been in a constant bubble since then. And, um, and that sense of uh, isolation and stress that, that they have been under for the past two years has been immense um, because they, they've had to keep themselves separate and apart from everyone else so that they can be uh, supported. So we've been providing uh, support there. But the workplace itself has become a, a very stressful, very difficult frontline place. When um, within, month, within the first month of us going into uh, lockdown, um, we were, were receiving phone calls from, uh, from business owners, from, uh, from <laughs> service providers across the country saying, how do, we, how do we support our staff? What do we do? There was this huge outpouring of how do we help? How do we, how do we make this work? And Workplace Chaplaincy Scotland's premise is that chaplaincy is a ministry for all believers. Um, and that there has been in the past a thought that chaplaincy requires you to be ordained. It requires this level of, of theological expertise. Um, and I would contend that it's a ministry for all, for all believers. I think that every member of every church can be skilled in the skills of chaplaincy so that they can have a conversation with that person in the shopping aisle, with that person who's coming to do some work on their house to provide pastoral support. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there, there's, there is something in chaplaincy that is part of the mission and ministry of the church, and it should be part of that uh, development and growth and discipleship of the church that we see more people engaging in ministry uh, and seeing it as part of that, their activity as growing and loving and caring in their church. Thank you very much, Andrew. I know you, your comment there about the Fire and Rescue Service, I think you just said like the Fourth Port Authority. Um, there were things that just never occurred to me. <laughs> and that's, you know, that speak, maybe self speaks volumes because I suspect there'll be others too. Um, and. I mean, I think I did, and I, I'm just not sure just how, when the people went and worked from home and were scattered, it must have, I mean, I could identify real challenges. And then, I mean, I'd be interested, actually, quite seriously, um, if after this, um, you could drop me an email, it might be useful if we actually just were to meet up sometime and had, a, and had that, and that wider, that wider uh, discussion, because I think I would find that, uh, that worthwhile. And on the second point, yeah, I think there is a responsibility on all of us who are believers to provide that support. I think the only thing I would say is that some, it just is the quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, some are more skilled at doing that sort of thing than others. Mm. Uh, I think we just got to recognize that there are different skills, and, but it doesn't mean to say that when you encounter it, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be able to feel that you've got some ability to, to, to share and to be... And, I think listening is probably quite important, but um, it, I would I would value an opportunity to talk, talk more about workplace chaplaincy, um, and if we can maybe set something up. Certainly, I would I would be del delighted to yeah. to do that, um, and just to to let you know that over this period of time that you've been moderator, 
um, we have um, recruited, trained and placed a further 30 uh, volunteer uh, mm. chaplains across the country. And in doing that training, we trained people who were interested, who felt the call to, to engaging with us. We trained over 100 people in, with chaplaincy skills. So we trained 100 people mm. within the church to be able to have that engagement but also um, have uh, been able to identify a further 30 new chaplains. So we've, you know, it, 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 it's been an important time and people have recognized that necessity of being able to, to talk and chat. And I will certainly meet up with you. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Uh, thank you, Randy, and thank you, uh, Lord James. Um, we've time for one more question. I'm aware we've got uh, two more professional chaplains on the call. We've got David Todd, who's our arts, chaplain and also Sally Fraser who's our city centre chaplain and I wonder whether either the chaplains wish to ask a question of Lord Wallace while we've got his experienced mind on the call. Sally or David do either of you want to ask a question please? I can't physically see you at the moment on my screen. Come off mute if you wish to ask a question please. I think I have met David. Uh, um, yeah. Sally, too, possibly yeah. I was deferring to Sally, but I, I don't have a question um, so, so much as to say, um, you know, in, in theatre chaplaincy, um, there, there's been the equal challenge of all the theatre staff being dis, dis, uh, being well being furloughed um, and and being at home and doing nothing. And how do you connect with people um, with whom I normally connect in the theatre in their place of work, and I don't have all their emails, um, you know, to 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 reach out. So um, apart from newsletters going through the, the, the organizations, it's been really hard to mm. keep in touch. Um, and, and just on, on David Strang's point about, um, or, or your point about the touching place, I did, a, I did a placement in Pullman, Young Offenders. And every time I met a young offender, they always shook my hand. And I said to the chaplain who I was working with, why do they shake my hand? That won't be in their tradition. And he said, no, it's because they have no human contact as prisoners. And this is a legitimate way to, to, to contact somebody. So actually, as a prison chaplain, it really is a touching point. Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, Lord Wallace, uh, we're very grateful for your time. And Peter Sutton's going to give a, a vote of thanks. But if I can just make one comment myself, um, you gave us the line of Christ is the voice that calls us to care. Now, I know just about everybody on this call, either by reputation or personally, and I think one of the things that we all have in common, we do care for people, and clearly you yourself as a moderator care for people. So we thank you for spending time with us, and I now hand over to Peter Sutton for the vote of thanks. Uh, Lord Wallace, um, we couldn't have hoped for a, a better 40 minutes together. And... Um, it's just lovely, part of Oasis is people making connections and to see you making such a valuable connection with Andy Gregg, who's a, a, good, a good friend of St Cuthbert's, is just what this sort of meeting is all about because it means we can take forward uh, the discussions uh, and your experience uh, to the next level. You kindly asked me to reflect on chaplaincy within the Church of Scotland. And I think it would be true to say that these are very testing times for the Church of Scotland and particularly as new presbytery plans are rolled out. There are a lot of vulnerable ministers who are fragile and many are feeling quite broken at the moment. And my wish and my hope, uh, moderator, would be if you have an opportunity to express that uh, at perhaps a general assembly as you hand over to your successor, that you know these are uh, difficult times uh, for us all. And uh, you're quite right. I think the ministers need perhaps more than ever at the moment to be looked after. But if I can just thank you for a wonderful talk. I was quite ready if your, if your internet had broken down, I'm guessing you're at your flat. I was gonna quickly gonna... come over on my bicycle and whisk you to the manse here to carry on with the, with the talk. But I'm glad, I'm glad we kept going. Uh, and if I can just say on behalf of all of us, a huge thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. And actually there was, a, there was someone in the chat from it's a Mr. Easton. Anyway, I have yes, I, I've copied that, and if I'll try and I will reply to it because if I try and cap it, I'll take it, I just type it out now. But I've I've got a copy of it, so.
Excellent. Well, he brings up an excellent point about hybrid working that people are going back to. Uh, the it's, it's, yeah. Again. So more opportunities for chaplain work there, which is very encouraging. So I wonder whether Oscar can give us back our full view so everybody can see everyone just to effectively say thank you to Lord Wallace. Again, thank uh, you all very much indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very thank much. You very much. God bless you and God bless everybody on the call. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Joining us.